I work with Nourish Scotland and I think it's very important that we know about international human rights treaties because it gives us the language with which we can talk about things that really mean something to us and it helps empower the people that we work with. I work for the Scottish Recovery Consortium and part of what we do is make recovery visible in Scotland, um, support, represent and connect and we do that. Just now we're having um, national workshops about rights-based approach um, within services and for people to understand the difference between rights bearers and duty bearers and we're also, we've got advocacy projects set up regionally um, to support people with addiction issues who are in recovery, who um, experience their human rights being breached and, and, and different things. So it's really important that we understand what's happening at an international level. I was involved um, in the Housing Rights Project in Leith, which was with the Scottish Human Rights Commission, PPR from Belfast and Edinburgh Tenants Federation. So I'm currently involved in setting up a new organisation in Scotland, which will be trying to take the learning from Leith into a much wider context. So it's really about how do we make um, rights real for people right at the grassroots in communities, um, particularly economic, social and cultural rights. Um, so might, the next focus might not be about housing, it might be about um, health and social care or poverty or social security. And, and the scoping study that we're about to carry out will be helping to narrow that focus a little bit for where we take the learning next in Scotland. So in terms of the housing rights project, um, we were really looking at that from a grassroots perspective of people who had never ever engaged with even the word human rights before. So how do you equip those folk with, with skills to be able to look at their own situation um, and try and frame that through a human rights lens? So we started off without even using the word human rights in terms of their, their dialogue and their participatory action and research. And then once they came back with indicators, which were really about the right to an adequate standard of living and the right to housing, it was then that we were able to support them through training to be able to focus on their rights through international um, human rights lens. And it was really about, okay, well, what does this mean in terms of you've got mold, you've got um, poor heating? What does that mean? What does international law say about that? What does domestic law say about that? And what is your perspective? And then trying to get folk to, to, to then set indicators and benchmarks for the duty bearer to be able to respond to what their rights um, claims were. So from that perspective, it was much more about using a rights-based approach than actually engaging with international national treaties or going to the UN or you know being involved in the UPR or anything like that it was much more right at the grassroots I'm in really poor housing how do I engage with these issues in a rights-based way And why training on um, incorporation is important for civil society is that civil society is big and diverse. There are big organisations in there and smaller ones. Some of the big ones have used UN mechanisms before. Some of them have are you know campaigning for um, new human rights legislation, but a lot of them haven't. Um, they've never heard of them before. Um, it's not of any kind of use to them in their day-to-day -day practice. So if we've got new legislation coming in Scotland, we need to make sure that it's the best legislation that we can get, that we hear from all different sides of um, civil society in how they use um, international treaties, what kind of impact new legislation would have, um, just to make sure that we are advocating for the best legislation that we can get. I think it's really important that civil society receives training on, on the language that they need to use when they're talking about these things. Um, in a sense that it's really important that people are communicating in a way that's meaningful mm -hmm. and that rights become much more real to people because they feel quite abstract, I think, a lot of the time. I think society needs training on engaging people, real people, in their real life situations, mm -hmm. much more so because it's really important that their voices are heard in these discussions because they're the people that will be really feeling the difference when incorporation comes to, to reality. Mm -hmm. um, and I think... I think it's really important that the people that are, are engaged in these discussions are ones that are often are the ones that are often excluded from these discussions. So, for example, people that have real life experiences around. Uh, so, for example, uh, with regards to cooperation of the rights of the child, making sure children are involved in those discussions. With regards to the rights of food, making sure people that have lived experience of food insecurity they need to be involved in these discussions. Um, and and generally speaking, those who are really 
facing the reality. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of the language, mm -hmm. certainly um, a lot of people who are not engaged with the rights um, framework, mm -hmm. and I find it difficult myself because I've always worked on community development and housing. I'm new to human rights in the last four years. You know, so the language could be quite disempowering. And also, how do you access then those international standards in a way that's easy to understand? And if you're working particularly with grassroots organisations, how do you translate that difficult language into what it means for people right at the grassroots? I think that, for me, um, would be a really helpful tool. I think for public authorities as well, they don't really know about what their duties are as duty bearers. Um, and there's a bit of a fear about human rights. What, what does this actually mean? Does it mean litigation? Or does it mean that actually we could transform the way that we're working, um, which is delivering people's rights in a, in a much better way in terms of realisation of rights? Um, so there's definitely a fear there. So debunking some of those fears would be really, really helpful, I think, um, across civic society, but also for civic societies. Who are the duty bearers? How do you influence? How do you then also influence um, the regulatory frameworks, for example, when they're not actually engaging with human rights terms either? It's almost like a juxtaposition. You're not talking the same language. So how, how do we do some of that work at the grassroots as well in civic society? I think it's been a wonderfully interesting day. I think for me, to put it into more human terms, um, as opposed to there was a lot of legal people here, but bringing the lived experience in to make it more accessible and also to make um, organisations more accountable. So to actually ask them what they're doing, because they're all going to say they're doing it, but what exactly are you doing? How are you doing that? And how are you safeguarding the most vulnerable in society that we work with?